Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show, so send us your scariest work stories. Just go to darkstories.org. Also, go to eeriecast.com for more scary shows like this and to shop at the EerieCast store. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Prepare to learn a new name for a very gross act. Yeah, after today's first story, you'll finally have a word for what we at Dead and Roasted do to our least favorite drive through customers via window. Along with that, I've got a bunch of new scary and allegedly true work stories about search and rescue terrors and ghosts abound. So uh, here, take this goat coffee <coughs> and let me know if it tastes a little weird. Oh, you found a hair in it. Ah, that's supposed to be there, don't worry. These are tales from the break room. Repo Man from Anonymous. When I was 19 years old, I got a job off Craigslist as a repossession agent. If someone wasn't making their car payments, the loan provider would pay me to steal their car back for them. It was a mostly honest living, but it did involve trespassing sometimes, and I wasn't really old enough to get a repossessor's license. But I was desperately broke, and the white guys who owned the company needed someone who spoke Spanish and didn't stick out too much in a minority neighborhood. So from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, I repossessed cars with a partner for a cash commission. Throughout my repo career, my partner and I found ourselves in a few dangerous situations, but there was one in particular that always comes to mind whenever someone asks, what was the craziest thing that ever happened when you were a repo man? This is how I would answer. It was around 1 a.m. in a particularly bad neighborhood. It was a weeknight. Typically, there would be a fair bit of activity at this time. The local drug addicts love to hang around and watch as we take people's cars. Sometimes they try to talk to us, which is pretty irritating. Sometimes they make a scene trying to warn the person that we're taking their car, which is infuriating. But this night was unusual. There was nobody around. It was dead quiet. No barking dogs, no screeching cats, no sounds of traffic or wind blowing through the street, no rustling garbage cans, no ringing from the fences, not even crickets. It was just silence. It wasn't even really eerie or scary. Best way I could describe it was just tense. You can feel an almost angry tension in the atmosphere. The orange glow from the streetlights were all far away from the condos we were sent to look around. This made the area surrounding the condos especially dark. Even so, I could already see that the car we wanted was nowhere to be found. We decided to park our truck right in front of the specific condo on our run sheet, keeping it as close by as we could. We walked silently into the darkness of the entryway. I knocked at the front door while my partner watched around the building for any movement. With no answer and a few more minutes of dark and quiet, I was ready to drop a contact card and leave until my partner whispered, Hey, there's a light on inside. I followed his voice to the side of the building where, through a gap in the cheap vertical blinds, you could see the lights on in the main room of the condo. I looked a bit closer, and I saw that the room was completely empty. No furniture, no nothing inside, except for a full gallon jug of Sunny D, just sitting there on the floor in the center of the room. I watched closely for any movement. Soon I caught the shadow of a medium-sized dog hopping across the ground up against the window, and I saw the blinds sway back and forth. I was just about to go and knock at the door again, when my partner took off in a panicked run back to the truck. I felt him running before he could even say, Dude, let's go, and I followed. He jumped in the driver's seat and started the engine quick as he could. I took the shotgun out beside him. He threw the truck in gear and sped off in a hurry. My heart was pounding. I wasn't really scared, just startled and confused. His face was paper white, 
I could see beads of sweat coming down from his forehead, maybe from the running, maybe from fear, but maybe both. He was driving really fast. I could tell he was trying to catch his breath. I asked as calmly as I could, what happened? He snapped a look at me as if I had just asked him the dumbest question in the world. You didn't see that guy? No, what guy? The guy in the window. No, all I saw was a dog. That wasn't a dog. Now I was really confused. What? What was he doing? My partner was in a fully frustrated shout by now. He was running around on all fours, nude, like a dog. You didn't see that? No, I thought it was a dog. Nothing could have prepared me for that. I almost didn't believe him until he said, No, dude, that was a guy. He ran up to the window on his hands and knees and spread the blinds out of the way and gave me the goat. I was horrified. The goat? Like he put his stuff between his legs and showed it to you? Yes. Christ, that's gnarly. You didn't see that at all. No, man, all I saw was the sunny D on the floor, and I thought there was a dog running around against the window. That was the truth, too. For some reason, I really thought that was a dog. Maybe the sleep deprivation was getting to me. No way, dude, that was for sure a guy. I saw a little bit too much of everything. He was starting to settle down. I don't remember what happened after that. We probably just finished up our shift and went home. I went on to repo cars for maybe another year after, before I made a much needed career change. But nothing sticks in my mind about those days like terror on my partner's face when he told me what happened. It wasn't the most action-packed repo night I ever had, but it was definitely the wildest story. SAR Training Encounter From Anonymous I've been a search and rescue officer for over 30 years. Now I'm retired, living with my family in upstate New York. The story I'm going to tell you happened to me and my team during a training exercise in a deep forest in Pennsylvania. It was 1991, the year I officially became an SAR officer. I was at the top of my class, passing all the exams for the SAR protocols. My first mission was to go with my team to a dense forest in Pennsylvania for SAR training. It was a two-day survival training exercise. We prepared all the equipment we needed for the mission, including communication systems, climbing gear, warm clothing, and everything else. Food and water, of course, too. We were carried by a helicopter heading to Pennsylvania. Captain McMillian was quick to remind us this was just a training exercise. When we reached the dense forest of Pennsylvania, we landed on an open field that marked the LZ, where the training exercise started and ended. We marked the field for our LZ with yellow tape surrounding the whole area. Then we all headed out into the forest for our training. We found the perfect spot for our camping site, only two miles away from our LZ, it was better to stay close than too far away. As we unpacked our gear, preparing our equipment, we started a bonfire, relaxing while cooking our food. After that, we all went to our tents and slept for our training the next day. Day 1. Securing and Monitoring Early in the morning, Captain McMillian woke up and went out to secure the area monitoring all the surrounding places. We'd set up a training dummy on top of a tree and left clues all around the forest. Around 6 a.m., Captain McMillian woke everyone up. He got us ready for breakfast before the training began. He explained that the first training exercise was to find a missing person in the forest, whom he had hidden earlier. Our captain divided us into two groups. The rules were simple, the team that found the missing person first would get a free ride and have the rest of the day off, while the team that didn't find the missing person would be punished. We would have until 6pm 
with an estimated search time of 10 hours after the person was reported missing. Training began at 8 a.m. Around 4 p.m., both my team and the other team came back to the base camp, managing to find the missing person. We came back laughing and happy. Captain McMillian was intrigued and excited to hear how we'd managed to find the missing person working together. As the day came to an end, we all relaxed and talked until everyone got tired and went to bed. Day 2 First Aid, Navigation, and Survival The final day had arrived. The focus of the day would be on the most basic training skills for a search and rescue officer. Early in the morning at 3 a.m., Captain McMillian woke up everyone. He reminded us it was the final day, and he wanted to test if we were capable of performing the most basic SAR training. He blindfolded all of us, led us into the forest, about two hours later, we arrived somewhere, and he allowed us to take off the blindfolds. He told us to use our skills to find the LZ. He said he'd left no clues for us to find our way back. Captain McMillian laughed, saying, The helicopter will be here at 8pm. I'll signal the helicopter with yellow smoke, and I'll see you guys back at the LZ, I hope. Then he left. We were all taken by surprise, but this was part of the training. We would have to find the LZ before the helicopter arrived. We worked as a team, trying to figure out where the LZ would be located from here, relying only on the skills we'd been taught. All I remembered was that the LZ was likely located in the northwest. After that, we all headed the same way Captain McMillian went. It had been three hours and we hadn't found the LZ, but we hadn't given up hope yet. As we traveled, we came across a small rocky slope cliff. The compass showed that we were headed northwest, and we had to climb this cliff. Which was weird, because when Captain McMillian blindfolded us, we hadn't climbed or descended from a cliff at all. However, we continued on, climbing the cliff, until a rope snapped. This caused one of my teammates to fall, breaking his foot. We hurried to him, offering first aid to stop the bleeding. We had to carefully put his foot back into place. We were all horrified, but this was part of the training. We couldn't leave anyone behind. We worked together, using a stretcher to carry our injured teammate. It took us much longer to get over the cliff due to the teammate's injury, but we managed it. It was 6 p.m. We had two hours left before the helicopter arrived at the LZ. We walked through the forest, securing and monitoring all the surrounding areas. One of my teammates noticed something in the distance. He told everyone to stop, and as he pointed, we all looked in the direction he indicated. We didn't know what it was, but what it looked like to me was something standing on two feet with deer-like horns on top of its head. That thing was massive. From the distance, we could just barely make out its eyes, and what we saw scared the heck out of us. Its eyes were red, and it was looking back at us. We bolted, carrying our injured teammate. After running away, we couldn't help but feel like we were being followed. We picked up our pace, eventually hearing the helicopter pass us overhead, and we knew we were close to the LZ. We saw yellow smoke in the air, and we knew that Captain McMillian was nearby. When we arrived, he was waiting there for us, helicopter descending to the LZ. As we boarded and ascended, I looked down to see if that thing was in fact following us, and I kid you not, I saw a similar figure emerge from the forest, standing in the field and looking at us with its shiny red eyes as we flew away. When we made it back to SAR headquarters, we explained to Captain McMillian what had happened since he left. However, we left out what we saw, that thing that possibly chased us through the forest that day. We don't even know what it was. All we really know is that there's something bizarre and creepy in the forests of Pennsylvania. Demons in the Day from Anonymous. Throughout my career as a nurse, 
I've had my share of frightening, intense, and even unexplainable experiences. I've worked in oncology, med surge, nursing homes, and hospice. And with each specialty comes its own unique joys and challenges. My most terrifying experience occurred at my first ever healthcare job, home health. Before I was an RN, I worked as a home health aide. My agency would send me to different houses to help the elderly residents with things like bathing, dressing, toileting, food prep, cleaning, and other activities of daily living. I enjoyed it a great deal. Usually, I had good relationships with my clients and their families. But then, I met Ruth. Ruth was an elderly lady, in her late 70s. She had extremely limited capability to live by herself, due to her numerous lower extremity wounds and large size. She was well over 400 pounds, and could barely walk around her small bungalow-style house, making a 12-hour home health aid a must. On top of that, she was monumentally unpleasant. When things did not go exactly the way she wanted, she had the tendency to scream and throw an angry tantrum at whoever was nearby. To give you a sense of what it was like to be in that house with her abysmal attitude, I'll tell you that once she called a refrigerator repairman because the ice cubes in her freezer stuck to each other in a large bin she kept them in. I tried to explain to her, sometimes ice cubes do that when you pop them out of their trays and put them all together. Yet she still insisted that the freezer must be broken. When the very nice repairman came by and quickly found nothing wrong, she shooed him out of the house angrily with very harsh words. I showed him out, quickly stepping outside to apologize for Ruth's behavior. He was very kind about it, telling me not to worry. As I came back inside, Ruth was standing in the living room staring daggers at me. What do you think you're doing? She demanded. I tried to explain I was just showing him out when she interrupted me to go on a tirade about how I should never talk to anyone without her nearby, that I should never let anyone else in the house. She went on and on until she violently locked the deadbolt. Eight years later, I still think about that day whenever I pop ice cubes out of an ice tray. My manager at the agency began to assign me several shifts a week at Ruth's house, then more and more until eventually I was her only aide. The agency was all out of options, since either the aides that worked with her would quit or Ruth would get angry and fire them. Being a naturally cheerful person and a bit of a pushover, I was the only one Ruth liked, and so I helped her, enduring her endless requests, and at times her verbal abuse, day to day from 7am to 7pm. Between cares, she sat in her recliner chair in the den with her cat. I would sit on the front living room couch with an earshot until she needed something. It was during one of those in-between times, in that terrible angry house, that I experienced something I will never forget. While sitting on the couch watching TV, I began to nod off a bit. It was the middle of the day, and even though Ruth was probably also asleep, I knew I should try to stay awake since I was still on the clock. Even so, the couch was comfortable and the sounds of the TV were lulling me to sleep. Suddenly, I jolted awake. At first, I was embarrassed I'd fallen asleep at work, but soon I realized I had much bigger problems. I attempted to sit up, but my body would not listen to me. I was frozen on the couch. I tried to get up again, but to no avail. Desperately, I tried to move my legs, my toes, wiggle my fingers, anything. But once again, nothing happened. I felt heavy, stuck, like I couldn't breathe. I began to panic. I looked around the room, seeing the front door to my right, the furniture in the room, the doorway to the den, the bedrooms on my left. All of it was the same as before I had fallen asleep. 
It was like no time had passed, and I was just suddenly paralyzed. At that moment, I noticed Ruth's old cat walking up to me. Without warning, she began to frantically scratch at my head and face with her claws, digging in and tearing at my hair and eyes. Horrified, I tried to scream, but no sound escaped my lips. For what seemed like ages, I lay there frozen, unable to breathe, unable to scream, unable to tear this bloodthirsty cat off of me. But suddenly, I bolted upright. The first thing I did was take in a huge gulp of air. I took some deep breaths and tried to process what had just happened. I looked behind me, and the cat was nowhere to be seen. In fact, she was napping in the next room over with Ruth, who was also sleeping. I moved my arms, then my legs, never more grateful to be able to do so. I felt my face and hair, finding no scratches at all. Had I dreamt the whole thing? Surely not, my dreams have never been so vivid and painful. I remembered every detail of that house during the encounter in perfect order. The layout, the furniture, the time of day, it was all the same. After calming down a bit, I rationalized the whole thing as a crazy dream, and I tried to shrug it off and go on with my day. I might have lived the rest of my life thinking it was a dream if it hadn't happened to me again. A couple of weeks later, after a particularly contentious day with Ruth, I was sitting in the front living room again when my eyes began to feel heavy. I fought sleep for a short while until finally I gave in to a quick nap. At least, that's what I told myself. Just like last time, I was suddenly jolted awake to find myself paralyzed, frozen in place on that couch. I wiggled all my fingers and toes, desperately trying to snap out of it the way I had the first time, but nothing happened. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. I was terrified. The room seemed to darken, and my eyes roamed wildly around the room, afraid of the imminent appearance of the cat. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the front door beginning to creak open. I knew for a fact it had been locked before and deadbolted, since Ruth was very strict about these kinds of things. I watched in alarm as a dark, shadowy figure entered the living room and seemed to float in slow motion across the floor. This figure had no distinguishable features, but it had the vague impression of a tall man, perhaps with a hat, maybe even a long trench coat. Even though it was a bright summer afternoon, the figure seemed to bring a darkness with it that made it hard to see and all the more terrifying. I watched, helpless, as the shadow slowly made its way across the room, from the front door, past the end of the couch, through the door on the left, into the bedrooms. All the while, my whole body screamed at me to do something, to get up, to yell, anything. But all I could do was lie there, in fear, miraculously, a thought came into my head, and I cried, Jesus, help, Jesus me. help me. At once, I could move again. I sat up, and convinced that someone had broken into the house, I began to search the rooms for the figure I had seen. There was no one to be found, and when I checked the front door, it was locked and bolted, just how I'd left it. Again, I told myself it was all just a bad dream. I promised myself never to fall asleep on the job again, and I haven't. In later years, I researched my experience, and I believe I may have had some sort of sleep paralysis. I've had a few more instances since then of waking suddenly, unable to move or speak, but I've never hallucinated nor seen anything unnatural during those times. Perhaps the thing I saw at Ruth's house was simply a hallucination, a product of my mind in the grip of sleep paralysis. Or maybe 
The anger and bitterness of that woman's house enticed some sort of dark energy to haunt its occupants. I may never know what truly happened those years ago, but I will certainly never forget it. The Children in the Church From Clever Songbird I worked at a living history site from 2014 to 2019. Something you should know, historically, was that back in 1656, Spanish colonists built a settlement in what is now my hometown. It was a Catholic mission run by Franciscan friars and was in existence until 1703, when English troops pushed the native Apalachee and Spanish out of the area. In the late 1980s and 1990s, the site was excavated and a museum was built with recreated buildings from the mission era. This included a military fort, a traditional Appalachian council house, a Spanish dwelling, and of course, a church. I worked there as a museum interpreter, which meant I would roam the site dressed in garb from the 1703 era, bodice, long skirt, petticoats, etc. I would talk to visitors, teach workshops, lead school groups, educating folks about the site and the people who once lived there. One of my tasks, along with my colleagues, was to lock up the site. Several of the buildings have traditional iron locking mechanisms and heavy doors, so it can be a wary task closing everything up for the night. One day it fell to me to lock up the church, as we were short-staffed that day. Now, the church is the one building that always filled me with a sense of caution. Per ancient Catholic traditions, when someone died, they would be buried under the floor of the church, which is said to allow them to be closer to God. More than 300 souls are buried under that dusty red clay floor. I always tried to skirt around the edge of that particular area. To lock the church, you have to close four side doors, the two heavy cypress and ironbound doors at the front, walk across the church to the front, clamber over the altar rail, and exit through a service entrance through a back room. I had just locked the doors and had begun to walk to the front when I heard something. It sounded like feet, feet scurrying around above my head in the choir loft. This would be impossible because the loft is more than a story up and accessible only by ladder. Not to mention that church was empty. We always checked. I figured at worst I was hearing squirrels, always the darn squirrels. I kept walking only to hear the footsteps again. Only this time they sounded like they were running on the dirt floor on either side of me as it makes a distinctive powdery sound when you move on it. I stopped and looked around, thinking there was some kind of animal inside the church. That's when I heard it. A laugh. A child's laugh right in my ear. And no, it wasn't the joyful giggle you might expect. This was mocking, malicious, and terrifying in the most gleeful way possible. I bolted, the laughter getting louder, seeming to fill the whole building, along with a strong smell of sacred incense used for mass. As I swung my leg over, something grabbed the hem of my dress and pulled. Two sharp and strong tugs on my damask skirt. It felt like little hands pulling at my skirt, like when a child is trying to get your attention. I yelled out in the same voice I used for misbehaving kids on school tours. Basta de esto, which means enough of this. Everything then stopped. The smell, the feet, the laughter, it all stopped. I got out of the church, stumbling back to our main building. A colleague told me that everyone had experienced something unusual on the site from the stomping of boots in the fort to the sounds of yelling in the church, even the smell of cooking from the friary kitchen. From then on, I always left the side doors open 
so there was always light in the church, and I would close those from the outside once I'd locked up the service entrance. I also did some research, making sure to leave small offerings for the dead, usually rosemary and fresh flowers. And for the children in the church, I would leave corn husk dolls and marbles. Hopefully, they find these more amusing than scaring visitors and interpreters. A Mangy Dog or a Skinwalker From Snow Squirrel This story was, oddly enough, told to me in the break room of my workplace. I have many stories throughout my life, from encounters with the Fae to flesh pedestrians. My family has had encounters long before I was born, and I believe they will continue for generations to come. However, today I'm going to start with an encounter a friend told me. For her privacy, I'll refer to her as Jay. Jay and I sat down in the break room for lunch one day. I mentioned to her that I couldn't sleep the night before because I'd heard something running around in my yard lately at night. It was getting annoying. I mentioned I believed it to be a flesh pedestrian, and she asked how I knew it was a skinwalker. I gave her a look, asking her how she knew I was talking about that. Well, I saw one when I lived in Arizona, she said. I set my Philly cheesesteak aside, leaning in and saying, Oh, this I gotta hear. She obliged and began to tell me her story while we ate. So, when I was 21, I lived in Arizona with my dad. My stepmother had these two little dogs, chihuahua mixes. You know, the annoying yappy kind. I nodded, mentioning that my aunt had a chihuahua named Tinkerbell, and the small demon pup was about to turn 18. Jay took a sip of her drink and continued on. Yeah, then you already know, yappy little things that kept escaping the yard whenever they had a chance. We lived in an area with a clearing leading up to a forest, and of course the dogs got loose again. I was in the yard helping my stepmother search for them. Suddenly, I spotted movement on the edge of the forest. While my stepmother called for the dogs, I went looking to see what it was. I saw this gray creature slinking across the clearing in the woods, moving back and forth in a serpentine-like way. It was low to the ground. I raised a finger, asking if it was the skinny, lanky human shape or the one with the deer skull. Neither of those, she replied. It looked like a greyhound, a whippet, but it was all wrong. The sun was setting, so I didn't get the best look at it, but it definitely looked like a super messed up dog, except dogs don't stalk you like that. I nodded again, noting that a whippet or a greyhound was a pet. It wouldn't be hunting someone to begin with. Yeah, so I see this mangy looking dog. It's too long, low to the ground, stalking towards us. My stepmother's dogs are nowhere to be found, and she doesn't even see it coming. She's still looking for her dogs. I turn towards the house, telling her to run. At first, she didn't want to listen to me, until I pointed out the creature getting closer, assuring her that I would explain later. We quickly made our way back into the yard and into the house as I watched it come closer. We locked the doors, staying inside the remainder of the night. It didn't seem to follow us. Luckily for my stepmother, the neighbors found her dogs a few houses away the next morning. I commented that it definitely didn't sound like it was a dog. We finished our food, and I glanced up at the time clock, informing her that, unfortunately, I would have to share my own encounter another time. Sadly, that would be the last time I saw Jay. She left the company before we had another spooky lunch session. It's not a very long or even a scary encounter, but it was an encounter from one of the few people I've met who's lived a life as strange as mine.
If you're listening, Jay, thank you for telling me your story. The Ghosts in the Art Studio From Mystery Hauntings I'm a 21-year-old girl, but since I was little, I was sensitive to the paranormal. My mom told me when I was seven years old, I had a strange encounter. We were coming back home from a New Year's Eve party in my uncle's house. My mom said I wasn't acting normal. I kept looking at something that she couldn't see, but she brushed it off. That night, I couldn't sleep. I was crying all the time, yelling, She's here, Mom, she's here. But any time my mom asked who she was, I didn't respond. Instead, I just repeated, She's here. After a few hours, the fatigue won, and I fell asleep. The next morning, I didn't remember anything. My mom asked me who I was seeing, but I couldn't recall who that woman was and still to this day, I can't make out her face. A few years later in my preteens, smaller occurrences began to happen, like the lights turning on even though I checked they were off, books falling from the shelves, and no, in this case it wasn't gravity. The type of shelves I had, you had to reach and pull the book out for it to fall. I would sometimes have the sensation that someone was climbing into bed with me, just some tiny things. Recently, a few weeks ago, I experienced something in my studio that I just don't have any explanation for. I have two cats, and one day I brought them with me to my art studio to work. That way they could run around. I work in an art studio in my own home. That day, as usual, they were outside on the rooftop of my neighbor's place, catching the sunlight. I was preparing my afternoon coffee, heading to the room where I was working, when I saw a tiny shadow. This shadow had the height of a three-year-old child. It was on the door to the room on the right. Of course, I immediately thought it was one of my cats, but when I looked outside, there they were still, nowhere near where they would need to be to cast that shadow. I checked the room where the shadow might be coming from, but the blinds were pulled down, so it couldn't have been the sun casting a shadow from within that room. I forgot about it for a while, continuing to work. A few days later, I was drawing at my desk when from the corner of my eye I saw another shadow. This one was the height of an adult male, standing in my room door. I ignored it, but a few hours after that, I saw the shadow again. This time I was quick enough to see the shadow move from one side of the door to the other side down the corridor. My heart raced. After that, I didn't see any more shadows, but I could still feel a presence from time to time, and my cats felt it too. When they were sleeping in the sofa next to my desk, I felt something, and the cats looked over at the door as well. I don't think these shadows or ghosts mean any harm, and I think I know who they are. The small child, I think, is my brother or sister, which my mom aborted three years ago and the shadow man, I think, is my grandpa. Of course, I can't be sure, but I feel like they're attached to me somehow, like they're protecting me. A few days ago, I learned my mom also feels something in her own home, a presence of some sort. Haunted Bar from Lay Bay my mom owns a bar in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which has been known to be haunted for many years. Staff and customers have experienced ghost sightings, chairs at the bar pulling out by themselves, smoke detectors going off with no one there, and the smell of cigar smoke lingering in the air. And of course, there's no smoking inside the bar. I must say I'm a skeptic of the paranormal, I like to find rational explanations for things, but I'm not sure what to think anymore after this experience the other night. My mom was finishing up closing down the bar. Since I'm training to take over the business one day, I shadowed her some days out of the week. The night this happened, my mom was showing me how to close up everything for the night. She's always told me that she hates being there alone after closing. When we were making sure all the tables were cleaned and reset, 
We heard the back door slam so hard, I felt the vibration. We jumped out of our skin. All the customers had been kicked out and the employees had gone home. My mom turned to face me, giving me a knowing look. She shook it off though. My attention returned to the tasks at hand. We put away the money in the day's deposit, and throughout the counting, I kept hearing an incessant clanking sound. It was coming from the kitchen. I walked towards the noises. Only the necessary lights were on, so my path was barely lit. I walked into the kitchen doorway. Empty. I locked up everything and told my mom she could go ahead and go home. I was going to do one last walkthrough of the bar. I locked up the office. The next thing would be to make sure all the unnecessary lights and cooking tops were turned off. I had just walked into the front of the restaurant when I heard what sounded like a whiskey glass slide across the bar. It reminded me of the old days when you were done with the drink. People would slide the glass down to the end of the bar when they were done. I jumped and quickly walked behind the bar. I checked the dishwasher underneath to make sure it was emptied by the bartender that night. Give me another. I heard this voice ask, clear as day, as if someone was actually in there with me. I stood straight up from my position in front of the dishwasher and looked around. I began to smell cigar smoke. I was so dumbfounded, I just walked out the front door and locked it behind me. It was one of the most weird experiences I ever had. Elderly Pervert From Fred 2 Electric Boogaloo When I was between the ages of 18 and 23, I worked at a local grocery store as a bagger. Eventually, I worked my way up until I was working in the pharmacy. I have a lot of stories, so if you like this one, I'd be happy to tell more from all the different jobs I've had. This was when I had just started to upgrade from a bagger to train as a cashier. While in the process, I took over the custodian job on Sundays and Mondays, while the usual woman had her days off. Everyone seemed to like me. They even called me Sunshine, because I was told I always had a bright attitude that cheered everyone up when I was around. The workers of each department knew who I was and were always happy to see me. It was a crappy job with little pay, but seeing other people happy made it worthwhile to me. Now, in our grocery store, we had a Starbucks. I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I would get a water every once in a while, and I would chat with the girls that worked there while they made other people's drinks. We had a high turnover rate, so I always saw new faces, but I would treat everyone the same, with a smile. Fast forward to a night where I'd just taken all the garbage from the gas station out front and the trash from the deli. Suddenly, someone grabbed me. I looked, and it was this girl I'd never met before, but she was wearing a Starbucks apron, so I figured she was a new hire. Fred, I need you to hide me, please. I have no idea how she knew my name, but it sounded very urgent, so I pushed open the double doors that led to the back of the store where I was going to dump the trash. It was where we kept the overstock, where new pallets came in, and there was a door to the garbage chute for the massive dumpster out back. Is there any way you can hold on to that trash? She asked. At this point, I was confused, asking her to fill me in. There's this old man out there, and he's been following me. I was taking out our trash when I noticed him coming up behind me. I didn't think much of him at first, but after dumping the trash in the chute, I went to the bathroom and he was still standing there. The look in her eyes was burned into my head that day. She was on the brink of tears. I let her know she could walk with me to the other double doors, and I would make sure the coast was clear. She clung onto my right arm for dear life. We walked all the way to the other side of the store where the other set of doors were. I asked her to let go and she nodded at me. I stepped out and there he was. I'd always noticed him around the store before. He wore a green raincoat and a faded red hat, which was so old it was practically pink at this point. 
He looked at me, and I could tell he knew what I was doing. I backed away into the safety of the back room and told her what I saw. He knew what we were doing, so I let her know that, and she held my arm once more. I told her we just needed to continue back to where we had started, and after doing so, I grabbed one of the metal poles, which we use in case a garbage bag is too full and will not slide down the chute. I called Damien. He was our co-manager at the time, and he's still someone I look up to today. He picked up his cell. Hello, this better be important. Why didn't you just call the front of the store? I explained our situation. He got quiet for a moment, then said, Okay, Fred. I need you guys to stay where you are. I'll see what I can do. He was ex-military, so I knew he would be okay if things got ugly. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, he came through the doors and explained what went on. Apparently, the old guy got fed up with us staying back there, so he went back to where the Starbucks girls were and began to take pictures of them. Damien knew who I was talking about in the first place, we just couldn't believe that someone could be so horrible. In fact, most of the girls working there were between 16 and 18. Damien kicked the guy out of the store, making sure he deleted those photos. We were told we could go home early to calm down and rest. As we walked to the front of the store, I finally turned and looked at the girl's name tag so I could properly introduce myself. So, Grace, is it? How did you know my name? She explained it was her first day, but she'd already heard a lot about me. She cried on my shoulder then and thanked me for helping. I'm so glad you came along when you did. I didn't know what to do, she said. I'm only 16. I don't know anyone here except the Starbucks manager. I was going to call 911, but I left my phone at the kiosk, so when you came along, it was such a relief. I never really thought that I'd ever get caught up in something like this, but I'm glad I'm known well enough that I could be there for someone in need. Grace and I stayed friends for the remainder of her time working at the store, but eventually she got a new job. From then on, I always made sure to keep an eye out for that man, making sure he never went near another girl again. Scary Trucker Story from Anonymous. It was a late autumn night, the kind of night where the air was chilly and the stars were crisp and bright. I had been driving my big rig down the highway for hours, my only companions the sound of my engine and the darkness outside. As I drove, my mind wandered, thinking about my family back home and the upcoming holidays. But something caught my eye then, a figure standing on the side of the road. As I approached, I could see that it was a man. His thumb was outstretched, and a backpack was slung over his shoulder. I hesitated for a moment. I had heard enough stories about hitchhikers, how they could be dangerous. But I figured I could manage myself. I am no small guy, after all. And besides, the guy did not look too threatening. I pulled over and rolled down the window. Need a lift? I asked. The man didn't say anything. He began to climb into the cab and sat down beside me. I noticed right away that he had a strange, intense look in his eyes, like he was sizing me up, trying to figure me out. But I didn't pay it much mind. Maybe he was just shy. We drove on in silence for a time, the only sounds being the hum of the engine and the occasional rustle of the wind outside. The man didn't say anything, didn't ask where we were headed, didn't make small talk. He was starting to get a little uncomfortable, but I figured he was just tired, or maybe he didn't speak English very well. It was then I noticed something strange. Every time I glanced over at him, he was staring at me. Not a quick glance, a long, hard stare, and there was something in his eyes that made my skin crawl. They were cold and dead, like he didn't have any emotions at all. I tried to focus on the road, but I couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on me. It was like he was trying to read my mind or something, trying to figure out my weaknesses. 
I started to get nervous, wondering who this guy might be, wondering what he wanted really. As the miles ticked past, the silence grew thicker. I kept stealing glances at him, and he kept staring back. It was like we were locked in some kind of weird staring contest. Then suddenly, he spoke. You ever pick up hitchhikers before? He asked, his voice low and cold. I was taken aback. It was the first thing he'd said in so long. The question seemed to come out of nowhere, but I tried to keep my cool. Uh, not often, I replied. Why do you ask? The man shrugged and went back to staring out the window, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about him. Finally, we came to a rest stop. I pulled in, hoping that the man would get out and be on his way. But he didn't move. He sat there, staring straight ahead with those cold, dead eyes. I was starting to feel trapped. I didn't know what this guy was capable of, and I didn't want to provoke him. But I knew I had to do something. Hey, I need to take a leak, I said, trying to sound casual. Want to get out and stretch your legs? The man shrugged and climbed out of the cab when we parked. I watched him walk around for a bit, trying to get a read on him. But he didn't really do anything suspicious. Just paced back and forth, smoking a cigarette. But then, as he was getting back into the truck, I saw something that made my blood run cold. A glint of metal in his backpack. I couldn't quite make out what the metal object was but it looked sharp and dangerous. My heart began to race, so I tried to think of what to do next. As the man settled back into his seat, I noticed his backpack had shifted slightly, and the metal object was now more visible. It was a hunting knife, its blade glinting in the light of the cab. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead as I tried to stay calm. The man seemed to sense my unease, and a small smile played across his lips. You seem nervous, he said, his voice low and menacing. There's something you want to tell me? I tried to play it cool. No, just tired from driving all night, I said, forcing a smile. You want some music? I reached over to turn on the radio, hoping the noise would drown out the pounding of my heart. But as I did, the man's hand shot out and grabbed my wrist, gripping it tightly. I don't like music, he said, his eyes narrowing. I like silence. His grip was like a vice, and I could feel the blood rushing out of my hand. I tried to pull away, but he held on tight. I knew I was in trouble. But suddenly, he let me go. He leaned back in his seat, face relaxed, as if nothing had just happened. You're a good driver, but you gotta learn to relax, he said almost casually. I didn't know what to say. The man was clearly unhinged, but I knew nothing about him. At this point, I just wanted to get him out of my truck and get as far away from him as possible. But then something even more terrifying happened. As we drove on, the man began to hum, but it sounded like a more low and guttural sound like something out of a horror movie. Then he began to sing. It was a song I'd never heard before, but it was both haunting and beautiful. I couldn't take my eyes off of him as he sang, his voice rising and falling in a strange otherworldly cadence. And then, as suddenly as it started, the singing stopped. The man turned to me, his eyes blazing. I'm gonna kill you. Then I'm gonna sing to your soul. I don't remember much after that. I guess I blacked out. What I remember next was waking up in a hospital bed. The doctors told me I'd been found by the side of my road, my truck abandoned but okay. There was no sign of a man or the knife. To this day, I don't know what happened that night. But I know one thing for sure. I will never pick up another hitchhiker. Nearly Killed Without Realizing It From Colby D. This happened while I was serving as a missionary. 
It's one of the scariest experiences of my life. It's also the reason why I'll forever be grateful for what people refer to as their gut feeling. I was in the rural country of northern Georgia at the time. Five of my friends and I received a call from our church leader to go to the house of a close friend to help them with their yard. Being volunteer missionary young men, we jumped at the opportunity. We traveled to the corner of northeast Georgia, to a place that wasn't even a town, but more a neighborhood with huge houses and spacious woods on all sides. I actually can't find the place on Google Maps, as there was literally no distinguishing features or landmarks to go off of. After an hour of driving, we arrived at the house. We were met by a woman who we'll call Linda. Linda told us to drive up the hill to help her on her sister's property. When she told us this, we drove up a paved road that looked like an escape maze from a kid's menu at a restaurant. We soon arrived at the top of a paved road in the hill. When we got to the top, we saw three abandoned trailers. The entire property was littered with trash and garbage. Imagine the TV show Hoarders. But rather than one house being messy, it was an entire acre of property in shambles. The woman's sister, who we'll call Sherry, was not there at the time. So Linda showed up to the property with her husband, Brett. She told us that we were doing this without her sister knowing, as her sister was a hoarder and a serious drug addict. She told us to throw everything we saw into a big metal trash container. At this, we felt a bit uneasy, but we continued on. I wish we'd listened to our gut. Linda said we had to clear out everything before her sister got back, as Linda had actually bought the property back from her sister and was due to have the lease in a couple of weeks. Linda and her husband left, and we got started. I won't talk too much about the cleaning process. There wasn't much of anything noteworthy to mention. Not until I started working on the property that was straight up the hill, each of the trailers were within a 50-ish feet or so distance from each other, so we were all within sight and sound of one another. However, I was always the type of person to explore abandoned places, given the reasonable opportunity. I decided to be adventurous and go to the back of the first trailer, being out of sight of my friends now. I get to the back, and there's just so much trash continuing to pile up towards the incline of the hill but there was also an open door, the back door. I began to walk towards it. As I approached, I noticed that it was littered and piled to the ceiling with trash, yet there was enough room for a walkway to get around inside the trailer. As I got about five feet away, I stopped. Something in my gut screamed at me to run out of there immediately. I did just that, and when I got back in view of the others, Sherry was at the property. I had to have been back there for only five minutes or so, but I never heard a car arrive. Apparently, Sherry was inside the metal container, throwing stuff we'd put in back outside onto the yard. We were all uncomfortable as Linda pulled up, beginning to argue with her sister, so we decided to leave. Now you might be wondering why I'm sharing this story if it's just about a little bit of family drama. I wish I could say that's all there was, but something else happened at that property while we were there. An older gentleman from our congregation had been acquainted with the project. He decided to meet up with us the same day for dinner, so we met up at a huddle house, a diner. The man, Carl, told us that after we left, the two sisters had a serious falling out. He told us that when he showed up three days later to assist with the project, there were cops at the trailer property. He explained that the cops were called by Linda, who had seen someone in one of the trailers. Apparently, the cops had found armed squatters in one of those trailers. The trailer, straight up the hill, the one I nearly walked inside of. I asked how long the squatters had been there, and apparently they'd been there for weeks. When he said this, my heart stopped, and my mind froze for a moment. I then realized None of my friends at the time knew I'd gone up behind that house, and I was possibly only feet away from walking in on multiple squatters. This place was in the middle of nowhere, and there were squatters likely watching us from the windows. 
Currently, since that time, I've been acquainted with seven styles of martial arts, as well as both knife and gun disarming and combat. At the time, however, I barely had just started with martial arts. I wouldn't have stood a chance against one squatter, let alone multiple at once, in a secluded area of the woods. To this day, I'm grateful I listened to my gut feeling when it mattered most, and I recommend everyone hearing this to do the same. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>